Well, welcome everyone to Thales College this evening for our Smith Lecture Series. I'm Philip Johnson, the Dean of Engineering here at the college. Uh, we would like to thank Christine Smith, our generous sponsor of this series on behalf of our parents, Sydney and Cecile Smith. Tonight we have the privilege to hear from Dr. Chuck Bokel. Dr. Bokel holds a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania and doctorate in education in applied educational studies and MA in biblical studies and 40 years of engineering industry experience with his professional engineering license. He is currently the director of engineering at Oklahoma Baptist University and tonight's topic will address the question of virtuous engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Chuck. Thank you for the kind invitation. Uh, it's a thrill to be here. I'm going to talk to you about kind of a, an interesting topic, which searching the literature, there's not a whole lot written about it. Lots of stuff's been written about ethics for engineers. Uh, lots been written about Christian ethics, but almost nothing on virtuous Christian engineers. So I'm going to kind of scratch the surface tonight and be, uh, love to hear your comments uh, about what we talk about. So as you may know, if you're a nerd like I am, today's Pi Day. If you're a mathematician or a scientist or an engineer, you probably know what Pi is. It's an irrational number. You can hear what Spock says about that. And um, at my institution today, they're, they're making cookies because it's Pi Day. So I'm missing out on cookies. So th this is uh, some humor to start us off with. By this, uh, run this by the legal department, but don't go, or, but don't, yeah. Runs, but run super fast past the ethics department so they don't see it. And we've got to draw the line on unethical behavior, but draw it in pencil. And then some for uh, the Dilbert fans in here, you failed the online ethics course for the third time. You can't be an engineer for this company if you have no grasp of business, business ethics. You leave me no choice, I'm putting you on the management fast track. <laughs> Unfortunately, there's some truth to that. So I want to start out with a little story. When I was a newer engineer, uh, one of the things, one of the pieces of equipment that I worked on was hydrogen-nitrogen blending panels, which are used in heat treatment. You can see some of the things that they're used for. And I was, had only been working for a few years, and my company sent me out to visit a customer that was having some issues. So it was the first time for that company that I went out by myself uh, the, the customer was only about 45 minutes away. So I went there and started to look around and noticed that they had never put together the safety equipment. So we sent them all the safety equipment, but they never put it together. It was on the floor, <laughs> hence their problem. Now, if you know anything about hydrogen, hydrogen is explosive. So they have hydrogen and by the way, it leaks really easily. It's really tough to seal to keep hydrogen in. So where I was, there were flames all over the place and they were using hydrogen. And I will never forget this, this was more than 30 years ago. I started driving away from the plant and I literally started shaking because I thought they could have blown me and everybody in that plant to kingdom come. So my question is, was that ethical to let the customer hook up their safety equipment. And I'm going to say, yes, it was. That was the industry standard. The equipment was all made to, to specifications to, to meet the codes. And the assumption was that they would hook it up, right? But they didn't. So I'm going to start with that, and then I'm going to come back to that later. So by introduction, I'm going to make three theses. Engineering is not morally neutral. And for most professions, that would be obvious, right? But engineers, we sometimes think that we're neutral, right? We just do what's technically the right thing to do. But in, in many cases, that's not true. The picture of engineering as morally neutral is misleading. Telling someone to develop a design for a hazardous installation within the law and subject to prevailing engineering standards does not relieve engineers of the moral burden of deciding, for example, whether certain kinds of maintenance staff should be put at risk by adapting certain designs. So in the, over the course of my career, we have had some instances like that. Our assumption was that the customer 
would do the right thing, and most of the time they did, but not always. One of the things that I learned kind of the hard way is being a naive, naive new engineer, when I went to visit a plant, my assumption was that they were doing the stuff they were supposed to do, right? When we sell, sold them something, they followed the directions and installed it correctly. And that was often wrong. So as I got older, as I visited more and more plants, my assumption was the opposite. What did you do wrong? And then I'm looking for what did you screw up? Almost never maliciously, but nonetheless, that was often the case. One persistent bias is the view that engineering is an unbiased and objective practice because engineers deal with facts and figures, there's, so there's no place for opinions or ethics in the practice of engineering. I disagree with that. I think there is room for ethics in engineering. I think that we can do things sometimes morally questionable. Second thesis, engineers and employers are sometimes at odds over ethics. I was talking to a gentleman before we started here, and he was telling me that uh, his employer asked him to, let's say, embellish some things to help get some sales. I know that never happens, but you know, having worked for a number of organizations, I've certainly seen that often. And unfortunately, there are many famous cases where engineers recommended against something, and management said, no, we're going to do it anyway, and the consequences in some cases were, were pretty bad. The Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK did a study asking engineers and technicians their opinions about ethics. And I won't go through all of these, but all of these are somewhat concerning, where the engineers and technicians are saying they have some ethical questions about what their employers are doing. So if you think this is not an issue, it is. Obviously not at every institution, but at many companies it is. And we've heard in the news about Boeing, all these things that are going on, uh, my daughter happens to be an engineer that works for Boeing. She works on the military side, and we haven't heard any of those issues there. But that's kind of concerning because we fly on those planes. I flew on those planes to get here. So if you have that kind of a culture, then that can be a problem. Uh, one of our really good customers when I worked in industry was BP. And BP's CEO at one time was knighted by the queen. Uh, he was kind of on top of the world. But the rumor in industry was that they were shortcutting and not doing the maintenance that they were supposed to be doing. Why would you do that? Well, it makes your profits look better, right? But eventually that comes back to bite you, and they had a bunch of really bad accidents, uh, and people died. So uh, these are issues. My third thesis is that virtuous Christian engineers should be the most moral and ethical. So I'm going to try to build that case. So... This is just tentative, uh, and this is my own view of this, so folks may disagree with it. But I would say just a regular engineer, maybe one right out of the school. Uh, when I went to school many years ago, I won't say how long ago, but it was a while ago, we didn't take ethics classes. And now they are basically required, so not all engineers have gotten formal training in that. And then I would say an ethical engineer hopefully would be more moral than that. Uh, a Christian engineer hopefully would be at least as moral as an ethical one, if not more so. Virtuous engineer, and I'm going to talk about what I mean by that. And then finally, hopefully the highest level would be somebody that's a Christian and virtuous too. You might argue should virtuous be before or after Christian. I don't know. I guess it somewhat depends on the person. But this is kind of how I'm going to lay it out for the rest of the talk. So engineers. Uh, turns out that Thales of Miletus... A lot of folks called him an engineer. Absent-minded professor and an engineer. Well, that might, oh, I better not go there. That could be us. First philosopher in Western history, very wise, I won't read the quote. Astronomer, mathematician, scientist, engineer. So we have a good background for the school. Engineer one who solves problems that you did not know exist in ways you do not understand. <laughs> and you know, that's one of the kind of the fun things when you ask somebody that's not an engineer, what is an engineer? And many times they don't know, they don't know the answer to that. My own family, other than my daughter who's an engineer, they probably couldn't tell you either. I think it's a little bit of a mystique about what an engineer does, but generally held in high regard, maybe in part because of that. Someone who does precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge. See also wizard or magician. 
And I, I was just telling somebody at the beginning, you know, we would sometimes have a salesperson sell something that we couldn't make. So we had to figure out now, how are we going to make this thing because we've never made it before, or at least not to those specifications. But sales sold it, so we got to figure out how to do it. Engineers, professionals for the human good. Promoting the well being of the public is the primary responsibility of the engineering profession. At its best, engineering changes the world for the benefit of humanity. And my definition is engineers make our lives better. I may be a little bit self-serving since I'm an engineer, but I'm old enough to remember when we didn't have microwave ovens. We had real ovens. We had to cook stuff in, right? It took 30 minutes or more to cook stuff. And now I find myself standing in front of a microwave oven saying, why is this taking so long? It's three minutes. <laughs> but when you look at how far technology has come and who knows where it's going to go, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. The important difference between scientists and engineers is that whereas science aspires to express an ideal world, engineers use math and science as tools for approximating the real world we actually live in. So I tease my students all the time that the difference between Sheldon Cooper on the Big Bang Theory and engineers is they're pie in the sky, we've got to figure out how to make stuff work. So we use theory, yes, but part of the problem is we are concerned about economics, right? I tell students, you can only make something that somebody's going to pay you for. Whereas if you're a physicist and you've got a big government grant, it doesn't matter if it's you know, realistic or economic, but that's not the case for us. So one of the reasons why virtue and ethics are particularly important for engineering is risk. Some of the stuff that we do involves a lot of risk. So I'm going to tell you another story that I was involved with. We had a big uh, funded project and we put in a lot of money too. Uh, we, the company that I work for at, at this time, we sold industrial gases, so we were trying to sell more gas. In this case, we're trying to sell oxygen, pure oxygen. So one of the things that they, one of the customers wanted to do was to see if they could speed up the process of making this metal, the steel. So the way you normally did that was in what's called an electric arc furnace, an EAF. And these are smaller in size, so these are not big massive steel plants. These are what are often called mini mills, so they have a bunch of smaller ones. They're much closer to the supply as well as to where they're delivering the steel. And the way this works is it's a cylindrical vessel. It has a roof that swings open. They dump scrap in, swing the roof back over it, and then they drop three carbon electrodes in and start an ungodly amount of energy arcing back and forth, uh, almost like a plasma. And then they melt it down, and when it gets melted down, they swing the roof in, put some more in, do that three, four, five times. And also, while they're doing this, they are trying to get rid of some chemicals that are in there that are not supposed to be in there, as well as add some in that are supposed to be. So this device here is, I don't even know where that word came from, but it's basically an injector where they're going to inject chemicals in there again to get the right grade of steel. So one of the things that we did as a company was we helped speed up the process with these high intensity burners. And we would aim those in what, what were the colder spots in the furnace. So, and that worked well, that's, that's a, a very known and accepted technology. The, the new thing that we were looking at was trying to put some of those burners underneath, which nobody had done before. So we were gonna run this experiment and, and it was a lot of money. We spent millions of dollars on this. So we're gonna run this experiment to see if it would work. And again, our interest was selling the oxygen part of this. So what we did was we went to a steel mill in Greenville, Pennsylvania, a little bit north of Pittsburgh. It's a small mill and we took what's called a ladle, and a ladle is just a, a vessel for transferring molten metal around the plant. So when they would tap out an EAF, they'd tap it out into a ladle, and then they would take it to the casting station, pour out the molten metal. So we were using this as a surrogate, obviously much smaller than a real EAF. And so my part of the project was to study the heat transfer. So we put instrumented pieces of scrap in there. So I had thermocouples in there, I had heat flux probes in there, I had radiometers in there, all collecting data so that as it melted down, we could try to be able to model this later. So we did this and we, and, and this is what the actual vessel looked like. So roughly, 
probably a little bit taller than me, maybe five, six feet in diameter. So we, we hired a safety consultant to look at this. And the consultant said that, and by the way, it starts out cold. So you put in cold scrap and you turn the burner on underneath of it, hopefully it melts it down, right? So you have really good heat transfer. You, you have this hot gas is going through there. So we, we asked the safety consultant to look at this. And what they came up with is if this didn't properly ignite and we didn't have an igniter in there, sorry, we did have one, a temporary one in there, but if it didn't ignite properly and this thing had a one ton lid on the top, it could launch the lid five miles away from the plant. Okay, well, that, that was a little, that, that got our attention. So what they recommended we do, which we did, was to put a one ton blast mat on top of it. So it was made out of old tires and chains. So it was like a net, but it weighed a ton. So it was basically to try to catch it. We also built a bunker between us and the experiment. And again, this was a smaller mill, so we were doing this towards the end of the day, and the mill emptied. There was nobody else in the mill except for us. So we told our families, watch the news tonight. <laughs> Who knows, you might be on there. And obviously, there was very little chance of this happening, or, or else they wouldn't have let us do it. But uh, we ran the experiment. Unfortunately, the experiment failed because the burner was too intense. It just bored a hole right through the middle and, and, and didn't work uh, the way it was supposed to. So we spent a whole lot of money to find out it was, it was too intense. So nobody got hurt. But my point is, what we were doing was pretty risky. You know, we could have blown that thing up. We knew it in advance, and engineers sometimes do that. Uh, one time I ran an experiment with one of my colleagues. We ran it at lunch on purpose because the technician wasn't there at lunch. And what we did was a little bit dangerous. We were using oxygen and, and natural gas to make a flame. And we chewed through almost one inch thick boilerplate in about a half an hour. Didn't go all the way through, but and we knew it might. So, you know, again, sometimes you push the envelope and, and there's risk there. So that's why it's important that engineers are ethical because people can get hurt. So ethics. Set of moral principles, theory, system of moral values, consciousness and moral importance, branch of philosophy that deals with moral questions and values, system of accepted beliefs that control behavior, especially such a system based on morals. And Christian ethics, any study that answers the question, what does the whole Bible teach us about which acts, attitudes, and personal character traits receive God's approval and which do not? Engineering ethics. So lots of books have been written about engineering ethics. I teach a course on engineering ethics, but none of them that I've seen so far really talk about morals. So they talk about ethics, mostly in the context of following the codes. So if the code says to do this, you do this. If it says don't do this, you don't do that, but not in the context of morals. So I won't read this whole thing to you, but basically say that what the National Society of Professional Engineering, the deputy chief at the time, is saying is, in his opinion, there's nothing more important than engineering ethics because of the potential for risk. If engineers mess up or do something deliberately, then people can get hurt or even worse, they can die. The accrediting body for engineering is called ABET and they are then at schools like us and Thales are required to teach ethics. We're required to teach our students ethics. This, is, this was not always the case what it is now. The hard part is how do you measure that? How do you measure that a student understands ethics? You don't really know somebody's ethics until they're in a situation and you see how they react. You can tell them, you can show them the case studies, but it, it's, it, it's a hard one. Ethical engineering issue, matter of engineering action or practice about which there's disagreement. So engineers surprisingly don't always agree on what to do. Uh, Somebody told me a funny story about lawyers. I don't think it quite pertains to engineers, but if you have 10 lawyers in a room, you'll get 11 opinions, right? I don't think that's quite the same for engineering, but we, we don't always agree. So how do you decide which one's right? It's not always easy. Fundamental ethical responsibilities of engineers to not cause harm or create unreasonable risk. It's not to say we don't create any risk. We do. When you get on an airplane, when you get into your car, there's some risk, right? 
and we're willing to accept that, but we don't want any unreasonable risk. When we did that experiment, was that unreasonable risk? We didn't think so, because we try to take the precautions to make sure if anything did go wrong, we'd be safe. To try to prevent harm and any unreasonable risk of harm. So this is really one of the most important things. All the codes basically say the same thing. We don't want people to get hurt, and worse, we don't want them to die. To try to alert and inform about the risk of harm. So here's the tricky part. If you remember the Challenger accident when the O-ring failed, the engineer raised the flag and said, this, we have never gone this low in temperature before. We don't think you should launch. These O-rings are not going to, we, we don't think they're going to sustain, and they didn't. And management overrode them and launched it, and, and there were bad consequences. So some folks would say, did that engineer, did he do enough? Should he have gone to the press and said, hey, this isn't safe? Do you go above your employer's head? These are hard questions, right? He didn't raise the flag to his management, but he got overridden. To work to the best of their ability to serve the legitimate interests of their employer or client. So one of the definitions of a profession, is, and doctors, lawyers, accountants, and engineers would be considered professions, we're professionals. So we are not as tied to the employer as maybe some other professions are, meaning, if there's something that's not right and our employer says to do it and we know it's not right, we shouldn't do it, even at the risk of getting fired. Ethical practice critical in engineering for ensuring public trust in the field and as practitioners, especially as engineers, increasingly can tackle international socially complex problems. So this is the National Academy of Engineering, and again, they're saying what is obvious that engineering practice is or ethical practice is critical. So I won't read these to you, but National Society of Professional Engineers, when you have a professional engineering license, uh, you are bound by these codes. And you can see that, again, they're, they're designed to protect the public. Uh, this is my license. Uh, I'm licensed in Pennsylvania. And every time I renew it, it asks me questions. You know, did I, well, have I ever been convicted of a crime? Did I have my license revoked for any reason? Things like that. So uh, we, we are bound by those codes. And the World Federation of Engineering Organizations has looked at a bunch of these codes, and uh, they have some similar language, but this is what they're saying. So this is not just the United States. Demonstrate integrity, practice competently, exercise leadership, protect the national, uh, natural and built environment. So some foundational principles of engineering ethics, public safety. If there's something that's going to jeopardize the safety of the public, we've got to raise the flag and hopefully stop that from happening. Because the problem is that the public may not understand what's being done, so they can't protect themselves, right? They need somebody with specialized knowledge that can say, hey, this isn't safe. We shouldn't do this. Human rights, environmental and animal preservation. One of the areas that I worked in for most of my career was reducing pollution emissions. So I worked in industrial combustion. I used to tell people when I was in the industry that I was a paid pyromaniac. I mean, what better job could you have than that? But in our case, our particular kind of technology, over the course of the time that I was in industry, and, and I was obviously not the only one working on it, but we reduced pollution in many cases by 90% to the point that the air I'm breathing today is cleaner than when I was a kid. That's a fact. EPA has been collecting that data since 1970 for every major city in the United States. So that's kind of rewarding, right? I believe, breathe that air, my kids breathe that air, my family and friends. So environmental and, and animal preservation. And then engineering competence. So I won't ask Phil to make a comment on this, so I'll just make a comment on myself. But uh, a colleague of mine at my former institution and I taught as adjuncts at a local university and we used to joke that we would have some students, not many, but a few students that we said, please don't ever work on anything I'm going to use. Don't work on our cars, our airplanes, anything else, because they were not good students. They were not competent. They made it through somehow, but didn't want them working on anything that, that had safety issues with it. Scientifically found judgment, openness, and honesty. The challenge, of course, with some of these is you have an employer, right? And they may or may not be happy with what you're saying. Engineering, so the Royal Academy of Engineering in the UK, uh, these are some of their stated environment, uh, engineering ethical principles. 
Preventative, so prevention of unethical conduct by engineers. What do you do if your, one of your colleagues is going off the rails and doing something they shouldn't do? And prevention of th threats from technology to health and safety. So this is getting particularly important these days with stuff like AI. You know, how do we handle something that we don't really understand that well yet? We don't know where it's going, but yet it has potential for really good, but potential for really bad too. First principle, multiple engineering codes of ethics. So these four codes have all basically the same kind of language, uphold and advance for the engineering profession, integrity, honor, and dignity, and hold paramount the safety, health, and welfare of the public. So that's what we're supposed to do. Goal of teaching engineering ethics. Ultimate goal is not to produce moral engineers, but rather to instill careful clarity of insight and cogent decision-making skills. This author would prefer morally good engineers, but argues morality can't be taught and the teacher should only be concerned with teaching professional ethics such as those in the codes. I disagree with that. I think we can teach morality, and I think we should. And he doesn't disagree that it's good to be moral, he just doesn't think you can teach that. And at our institutions, we believe you can. Lots of famous engineering ethical disasters, some of them pretty recent, and some of them with really bad consequences. The good news is they don't happen that often, so when they do happen, they almost always make the national news, sometimes international news, but again, the potential is there for people to get hurt or even worse. Virtues, virtues the health and beauty and well-being of the soul, so Plato said that. Virtues the beauty of these qualities and acts of the mind, moral nature, Jonathan Edwards. Virtues the qualities that make one an excellent person. So you can see that there is a moral aspect of that. Character uh, trait that disposes or inclines a person to do the right thing. Of course, that's what we want, right? We want engineers to do the right thing. Excellent and stable quality of the soul enables a person to act well regarding some activity. So Kreeft believes that virtue is necessary for the survival of our civilization. He makes the, the statement that without virtue, civilization dies. Without religion, virtue dies. Therefore, without religion, civilization dies. Now, I know there will be plenty of people today that would disagree with that, but the main point is without virtue, in his opinion, civilization dies, and I kind of agree with him. So really important. As a result of virtue, men tend to do no noble things. Virtue requires good motives and good actions because without them, virtues would not be praiseworthy. So it's not good enough to just have that in your mind to be virtuous, but you need to act it out, right? People need to see that, that, that you are in fact virtuous. And according to Jonathan Edwards, true virtue must chiefly consist in love of God. So I'm gonna come back to that at the end as a virtue that I think is important for in, virtuous engineers. And for Thales Academy, three main areas of character, character formation, one of them is virtue formation. So that's a stated goal of Thales Academy. And at Thales College, virtue is mentioned nine times. That's unusual. I think if you go to most college campus, uh, most college catalogs, you may not find it at all. Maybe in a philosophy class, but not a whole lot. Certainly not nine times in all those different courses. So it's important here. There are some ethical frameworks how you view ethics. So one focuses on following the rules, laws, and obligations. And that's really what most of the codes and standards are about. Follow the rules. Doesn't matter if anybody gets hurt as long as you follow the rules, right? No, that's not good enough. It is possible to follow the rules and people still get hurt. Consequential, so the outcome that you wanted, that's the objective, right? If you had a good motive and, and you wanted a good outcome, then that's would be considered to be uh, ethical, right? But again, just because you want the right outcome, if you didn't do the right things, it could still be a bad outcome. Virtue ethics focuses on moral character rather than on rules or the consequences of actions. So do the rules, do the codes cover every possible thing? No, they don't. That's why they keep upgrading them every so often because things change, right? And what I tell students is, you know, you have to be able to think. You have to be able to critically think 
because you may never have come across this particular thing before, this context, and yet you're still going to have to make decisions. So that's why when you are moral, that you have a much better shot, I believe, of making a good decision. Virtue ethics, facts about virtuous agents, and in particular facts about virtuous character traits possessed by such agents, more basic than facts about right conduct, and are what explain why an action is right or wrong. What transpires may not be entirely within the control of the person responding, so what matters from an ethical standpoint is the quality of the decision at the time it was made, rather than the effects that emerge from it afterward. So especially when we're, we're venturing into areas that we don't have much experience with, you do the best you can, but you may not necessarily want to know what's going to happen. So the motivation is important, right? You, you, you did your best to make sure that things were safe, but sometimes they are risky and sometimes they don't all work the way you hope. Lots of potential virtues. And I'm going to go through this pretty quick, but I'm just going to kind of give you flavor for all the virtues that people have identified. So here's a tree of them. They're in Latin, so don't ask me what they are. I can't tell you that. At West Point, they have these 12 virtues. Kreeft has what he calls cardinal virtues, and you'll hear other folks talk about that. And what they mean by that is those are kind of foundational. If you don't have these, then it's pretty hard to have any other ones. And then also theological vir virtues. So in the Bible, we, we know about faith, hope, and love. Seven deadly sins, and he connects those to the Beatitudes. High six virtues. So Boyd and Tempe argue that these exist in all cultures at all times. And that's why he calls them the high six. And I think if you look at those, uh, I wouldn't argue with um, them either. Book of Virtues. Uh, so William Bennett wrote a really thick book. He's got a ton of stories about different kinds of virtues. And these are the ten that he focused on. You see some that are common, but some that are not. Learning the virtues that lead you to God. So here's a whole, another bunch of virtues. Another category, intellectual virtues. And then benefits of intellectual virtues. So I would venture to say at Thales, that's probably at least part of what they're trying to do is to teach students some intellectual virtues as well as others. Here's another author that looks at intellectual virtues, and then he gives a slogan for what he means by those. Here's a list of 60 classical Christian virtues. So here's 30 of them, and here's 30 more. So that's a lot. And Aristotle had an interesting perspective on this. He believed the virtue was the middle between too much of a good thing and too little of a good thing. And some examples, so if these are the virtues, then this would be the indeficiency side and this would be the in excess side. So again, taking a mediating position. And then here's an eye chart. So this is five different categories, intellectual, moral, civic, performance, and Christian virtues, according to this author. So a bunch of those. Again, the same theological virtues, uh, the same cardinal virtues, and then he has a third category, crown of virtues. And this author puts them by age, which is kind of interesting. It's the only one I saw that did that. So in youth, this is what he argues are the Virtues for youth, middle age, doesn't say what middle age is. I don't know if that's me or not. Old age, that could be me too, I don't know, but uh, different categories. So virtuous engineer. This author made up a new term which uh, they called techno-moral virtues. And that's where the hard part gets in sometimes for engineers is when we're pushing technologies like AI that have the potential to do some, again, really good things or really bad things. So this is uh, the connection in this person's mind between virtue and technology. And six more of them. So lots of them, some new ones like magnanimity, that's the only place I remember seeing that one. What about humanitarian engineering? So uh, Philip was telling me that when he was in school, they went to Africa, if I remember right, and did a project to help out a third world country, a developing country. 
And that's something we certainly hope to do as well. And there are some organizations to do that, not necessarily Christian, but ones that are trying to help uh, others. So there, there are, have been a few books recently written on that. And in both disaster and development work, engineering knowledge and skills have been underutilized. So this person's perspective, and again, I'm biased because I'm an engineer, I don't think we take enough advantage of folks that have the specialized skill that can help other people. And this is 10 principles of humanitarian engineering. All of them have a lot to do with sustainability. So what we're doing to our planet now, is this sustainable? Can we, will we have these resources in the future? Will, will we need them as an example? So virtues for engineers, so these are three different authors. Uh, you'll see there is a little bit of overlap. So all of them have honesty. And I think that makes sense for an engineer to be honest. Uh, I was joking with somebody earlier today that my solution to a lot of our political problems is we need more engineers. The problem is we couldn't get elected because we don't tend to exaggerate and you know, stretch the truth. But we would be able to make some technical decisions that they've made poorly uh, with the current group that's in there. Virtuous Christian engineer, society often embraces new innovations while wearing ethical blinders, galloping straight ahead without asking what path the technology might be on in the first place. Technologists whip the inventions to go faster, but Christians stop to examine the risks. We critique tech because tech does not self-critique. And again, AI would be one of the more recent ones. Uh, are we going too fast? Are we getting ourselves into trouble that we hadn't anticipated? But these ethical codes, when seen within the biblical narrative, have a limited scope. For the Christian engineer, professional ethics are necessary but not sufficient. Our call, call as Christian engineers is far more comprehensive. So just obeying the codes, just following codes is not enough. It's a good start. We shouldn't be violating them, but it may not be enough. Rise of the moral machine, the moral singularity, the point in time when super intelligent machines become far better at moral reasoning than humans. And as a consequence, humans will delegate their moral and political reasoning to them. Can you imagine us getting to that point? Were the machines thinking morally for us? That's kind of scary. Machines can have bodies that are human-like, but they will never have spirits. Humans have a creator, a person in authority, who designed and made humans as they are with both body and spirit. No one other than God has the capacity or the authority to create authentic humans. I want to believe that, but the way things are going, who knows? Responsible technology, again, it makes the point that engineers, we work with a lot of things that are potentially dangerous. And that's why it's incumbent on us to make sure that they're safe, because the users may not be able to do that for themselves. Jim Berg has some essential Christian virtues, and he takes them from Second Peter, commitment to Christ, courage for Christ, and compassion like Christ. And you can see the virtues. Here is my list. This is tentative. I definitely would appreciate any feedback you have on that. First one is wisdom. Again, we don't want any engineers designing stuff that they're not competent to do. We don't want the bridge falling down when you drive your car over it. Integrity, communication, humility, courage, love. And I think love is what separates a virtuous Christian engineer from just a virtuous engineer. Love of God and love of people. So for wisdom, James 1.5, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. By the way, I will freely admit that one of the stereotypes of engineers, and it is sometimes justified, is that we can be arrogant. We know more than other people. I hate that, but I have seen it. But we shouldn't have that attitude, right? We should have... Uh, integrity and humility. Let your word yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than this is from the evil one. So when something's wrong, you need to say it's wrong. Not give in. The boss says, you know, we promised to deliver this thing or, you know, we got a lot of money riding on this project. If it's not right, then you need to speak up. 
Communication, my dearly loved brothers, understand this. Everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. So uh, it's been said many times that God gave us two ears and only one mouth. So we need to be able to listen to. Humility, but he gives a greater grace. Therefore, it says God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. I've certainly, and we talked about it at lunch today, have met some engineering professors who are some of the smartest people I've ever met, and they'll let you know that. Not fun to be around, really smart, but courage, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So this one's a hard one when you work in industry. If your employer asks you to do something that's going against your will, let's say you have a young family, you know, you need a job. And, and in some cases, uh, like the Boeing whistleblower that just committed suicide, you may not feel like you have any other options. Right? So it's hard. I'm not, I'm not claiming this is easy. It is not. Last one is love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important command. Second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets depend on these two commands. So again, I think this is what separates a Christian virtuous engineer from just a virtuous engineer. We should care about our fellow man and about God. And I had a, a, a friend a long time ago that, that shortened it. He said, love God and then do whatever you want to do. If you truly love God, right, you will do the right things. Again, not easy to say, not so easy to do. Conclusions, importance of good judgment. There is no good engineering, no good science, and so on without good judgment, and no good judgment in these disciplines without ethics. And judgment doesn't, you don't get that overnight. You don't come out of school with good judgment, at least not, that's not been my experience. It takes time to get that, right, seeing some things that worked and seeing some things that don't work but it's important. I gave you three theses. Engineering is not morally neutral. Engineers employers sometimes at odds over ethics. By the way, I would say honestly that I'm encouraged by where we're going with that. Maybe not for the right reason, but my last employer, their lawyers basically said, and they they said a whole lot more politely than I said it, but they basically said, if you do anything unethical or immoral or illegal, not only are we going to fire you, but we might come after you legally too, besides the government. And why they said that was if you're going to sue somebody, you're going to sue a big company, right, because they have deep pockets. So I don't think it was for a moral reason, but regardless, uh, I was never asked to do anything that I considered to be unethical. So this is, and again, maybe driven for the wrong reason, but nonetheless, uh, that's a good thing. And virtuous Christian engineers should be the most moral and ethical. So lots of lists of virtues, you saw a ton of them probably a hundred or more, but no generally accepted set, uh, no generally accepted principles of morality either. So if you're a Christian, you would say the Bible is, uh, that's our source of morality, but that's obviously not for everybody. Stakes, stakes often much higher for engineers because of the potential to harm people in the environment. So we work on things sometimes that are dangerous. And that being said, we, it's incumbent on us to make sure we, we take the precautions. Virtuous Christian engineer is the highest ideal. Just because you're Christian does not necessarily mean you're virtuous. And I would say that because we often don't have that specific training. So that's one thing that I'm trying to teach our students is, yeah, we have the codes and we need to follow those codes, but don't let that be the end point. It needs more than that. Recommendations, educate students in the professional virtues. Engineering, educate Christian engineering students and the Christian virtues applied to engineering. So let me come back to the example I gave earlier. I asked the question, was it ethical what we did? And my argument is yes, it was ethical. But now I'm going to ask you a different question. Was it virtuous? Is it incumbent on us in that kind of environment where obviously the customer didn't know what they were doing because they didn't know they were jeopardizing anybody that worked there. Was that enough? Yes, we followed the codes, we were ethical, but was that enough? And I'm gonna say, no, it wasn't. This is not a Christian employer, it's a public company. That doesn't mean we couldn't have done that anyway, but when you have this kind of potential do you want to be the person working on a project to find out that your customer died because they misused the equipment? So we could have done more in that case. And honestly, at that time, I was too new. I didn't think of it through that lens, but now I think about it through this lens. So 
hopefully I've gotten a little bit wiser in my old age. And then just references.